We're now live. Welcome, everyone. This is Cannabis Marketing Live. I'm your host, Jake Litke, and today we are going to talk about how to get your brand on shelves. Um, we've got a couple of great people here today. I will let them introduce themselves. Uh, we have Anthony and Joshua. Anthony, why don't you kick it off because you're seeing right next to me in the little bubble here. Uh, tell everyone who you are and what you're doing. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Anthony. I'm the Chief Operations Officer of 40 Tons and the Creative Director for Rightsy. And what we do at 40 Tons is we're a social impact cannabis brand that believes if we're going to be making billions of dollars in the industry, that nobody should be locked up over a plant. Um, our entire team has been affected by the war on cannabis. Um, we take ownership of the fact that we sold weed without a license, but we advocate that uh, the punishments don't fit the crimes. And my partner caught a life sentence without the possibility of parole over a nonviolent cannabis offense. And thankfully, we hit the winning lottery ticket on Trump's last day of office when he signed the presidential clemency. And so we built the brand to bring awareness to his case. Uh, and then we ended up getting them out. And so we've just been paying it forward and we built a CPG brand um, in multiple states, as well as we have a whole careers infrastructure and an advocacy uh, effort. And so we appreciate being here with you today, Jake, from Media Jill and Josh from C3 and can't wait to get into this. Um, I think the dog might want to uh, say, yeah, you got to forgive yeah. me. A little chai weenie we got sneaks through the, the gates over here. So you got to. <laughs> Gotta forgive me on my end. Uh, definitely not trying to steal your thunder, Anthony. <clears throat> all good, all good. Um, well, yeah, I'm, my name is Josh, uh, Josh Smith. I work with uh, C3 Industries under their uh, retail uh, arm with the high profile dispensaries. Uh, I'm our retail buyer for our Michigan based dispensaries. We also have retail space in Massachusetts and Missouri, uh, and we are expanding to other states uh, within this 2023 year as well. Uh, we also have a, a full vertical approach in all of our markets. So we have cloud cover uh, canvas flower and cloud cover uh, concentrates that we uh, move through our retailers, but also through third party retailers in those different markets. Uh, personally, I, I uh, come to cannabis. It's been an interesting journey for me. I, I grew up the son of a minister and a lawyer. So um, I came through it from an education uh, point more so than anything else. But I was going to school in New York and you get exposed to some really good quality cannabis there in New York and uh, became a full-time customer in 2014 when I stepped into my first dispensary in California and uh, kind of just went all in on it from there. So I've uh, been really excited being on this side of the uh, industry and, and uh, happy to chat products and chat cannabis with anybody who will listen to me. Great. That's exciting. Um, yeah, I came by way. I've been we started media gel about five years ago now. Um, prior to that, I was in the traditional marketing, marketing technology space, working with large CPG brands. Even in the last five years, you know, we've come a long way. We weren't able to serve ads. I mean, anywhere. That's why we started the business. So we just realized no one can serve ads in normal channels. Um, and we've made it pretty far now. Um, it's taken a long time to get uh, the technology in place. We had to replicate a lot of things. And then just getting the the distribution, distribution meaning like where can you serve ads? And today we can actually put your ad on, you know, CNN, which is great. It took a while to get there. Um, but I want to circle back, Josh, to your, you know, you've got a bunch of different things going on. You're both growing, <clears throat> producing, retail. You're also creating products for other brands. You have your own brand within your shops. You're carrying third-party brands as well, right? Yeah. So you're buying, you're selling, you're producing. Um, how does, and, and the, the topic here is getting products on shelves, right? And so there's going to be a lot to talk about. And I think for context, uh, 40 tons and, and C3 do not have a business relationship today. Um, so we'll kind of work. Hopefully we will. Work. Yeah. We yeah. Will. So let's, let's do this in real time, right? Let's see how this conversation goes. Um, so, uh, let's, let's hone on the, on the buyer part. You're, you're doing buying. You've got a lot of people knocking on your doors in different states. Um, I know that, you know, a long time ago, it and maybe to a certain extent, it still is. There's people literally knocking on the door, right? Walking into the dispensary. Where's your buyer? How do I find the buyer? The buyer is probably hidden somewhere because otherwise you would just get inundated all the time. How do you manage that process from a buyer perspective? You're, you're on a lot of people's radar that want to talk to you. 
Certainly. No, I, I think um, there's some levels of, I try to make myself as accessible as possible, but I think within that, you know, you have to understand that that first impression can, can leave a lasting note in someone's mind. And so for me, we have a local store, I'm based in Ann Arbor and we have a local high profile in Ann Arbor that knows any new product that comes through, anybody who has brought in um, potential uh, samples that they would like to see in our stores, uh, they need to hold on to them for me to get eyes on them first and, and give the thumbs up and then I'll distribute amongst the staff to get their feedback. However, um, you know, you're making that first impression on the butt tenders before you even talk to me. So uh, they can be your best friend. They can also be your biggest roadblock. If, if you're not polite to the butt tenders, if you don't uh, frequent our shops, you know, it's, it's one of those things where uh, I've had people who finally get me on the line and they are only talking about one store and they don't realize I'm ordering for 12. So for me, that's a clear sign of you haven't done your research. You haven't really you don't you aren't invested in my company so you're asking me to invest hundreds of thousands of dollars into yours uh there's some levels of you can separate yourself from the rest with that first impression right out the gate yeah and is it usually going to be the bud tender that is the first point of contact and and you mentioned like do you frequent the shop do people have a strategy of like coming in for a few weeks and being a customer before they before they say, oh, by the way, yeah, I, I should say, like, I'm not gonna. I don't expect every brand to start shopping on our shelves before they get on there. But I will say, if if I have a staff member reach out to me and say, hey, this customer of ours who has been coming in for a while, and we all love them, and they have this brand of pre roll, I'm much more likely to reach out to them and ask for a sample from someone who. Uh, clear, you know, we all want to succeed in this. And, and I personally want everybody to succeed. So those who are supporting uh, our company and, and my bud tenders are ones that I know down the road when we are in a pinch or when something might have gone wrong with the delivery, they're a vendor that has our best interests at heart, uh, rather than just simply, we want to be another shelf for them to say their products on. Okay. Great. I'm going to go over to Anthony now. For sure. You, let's, and let's, how, when did you, day one for 40 tons, you've got a product now, you're trying to get it on a shelf or on a truck. When did you start that process? And what did it look like for the first, you know, six months, couple quarters? Um, just sure. walk, walk me through that. So before we even had a product, we needed to build the brand. So we wanted to build a brand first. Um, and then as we built the brand of who, what we represented and what our mission was, we started to fill in with our products. And so what we realized was, was that we needed to make sure that if you were to remove the 40 tons brand on the product, that the product would still sell. Because if you add the brand to it, it just makes it that much more. And so correct me if I'm wrong, Josh, but like, you know, buyers are looking for quality products at great prices, right? I mean, that's just the bottom line. So we needed to figure out all of that. But in addition to figuring out all of that, we needed to figure out where we were priced within the market. And I think brands sometimes don't realize what they're really known for. What we realized was that we weren't known for growing weed because we've never grown weed. We were always sellers of weed. We were the Uber of weed before there was Uber and Ease 20 years ago. So what we needed to do was we needed to build our brand on what we represented, but then at the same time, make sure that we find supply chain partners that provide the products that we need, but then also figuring out what those price points were. And so like we fell forward on day one, right? We you know, we were, you know, we worked with, 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 a, with a, a company that ended up not working out. Then we ended up, you know, trial and erroring it until we got to the point where now we know what, 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 I guess you can say what our offering should be. And it was just testing it out because if I have an eighth in the market and I'm competing against your alien labs and your seven tens and your cannabiotics, even if the weed is as good as that, it doesn't really matter because the brand isn't known for growing that weed. So that is where I've been really, really trying to dial in over these last few months is creating a price point so that buyers like Josh 
instantly want to carry my product because they're already oversaturated with the eighth weed that goes for 50 60 dollars an eighth right and so figuring out that product what that product's going to be it was is very very important and then once you figure that out then you go to people like Josh and try to get it on shelves. But if you don't go through that process and you just make a brand, you put out a product, you say, I'm going to sell it for $20 wholesale, you're going to have a problem getting it on the shelf. And we realize that. And so figuring out how we, you know, price our product, the affordability of creating it to get it to that wholesale price, we needed to figure all that out before we came to the Josh's of the world. Yeah, so Josh, when you've got a new, uh, someone's trying to bring a new product in, um, you know, what Anthony was saying is, you know, I, that's, I think it's great, right? Having a brand has a lot of value, right? Because if someone has, you know, otherwise you've got whatever design aesthetic on the package, no one's ever heard of it. They want you to put it on your shelf, but how are they going to support that, right? Um, mm -hmm. If people haven't heard of the brand or it has no other association to them, how often do you see someone pick up something random and say, Oh, I'm going to, I'm going to try this or is that <laughs> never if it's $50 maybe, eighth. Yeah. Yeah. Is it? And then, you know, does it then become part of the bud tender is the, is the key part there if you've got a new brand, but if you're buying something, you have to think about your shelf space is valuable. Right. So when do you, is that like a question that you ask people, like, how are you going to support this? What is your marketing budget? in this area to get awareness out? We, we certainly, um, we ask, do you have uh, the support to run vendor days, to run, uh, even if it's ghost pop-ups where you don't have a physical person in store, but we run a promo and highlight your brand and uh, we can get uh, reimbursement for any uh, product that we sell on that day. Like those types of things to, um, that I can honestly just bring to my team and say, hey, th this is a vendor that um, wants to help us out. Everybody right now is, is stretched super thin and doing way more than, than what they're asked to do. So any uh, symmetry and, and partnership where it's a brand that's bringing more than just a product to our, uh, to our shelves and to our stores uh, says a lot. It, it stands out. Uh, there also was something that Anthony mentioned that uh, wanted to touch on. Uh, understanding where you fit in the market and, and what other brands you see yourself competing with uh, is a big major self-awareness step that's needed. Uh, I oftentimes will ask brands, who do you see yourself competing with? Because then that gives me a sense of what the price should be simply based off of not only what those other brands are, are selling their products at, but how have the customers responded to those brands? Uh, a lot of people want to be the 710 uh, labs of, of rosin. However, rosin sales are limited. So I think some people uh, feel like, oh, that's the next golden goose, rather than just really thinking about the market, about the customer base, and who it is that they want to be uh, within that market. Um, you know, everybody wants to be craft beer, right? I'll use the beer analogy, but Budweiser and Modelo sell the most, mm -hmm. right? So it's understanding what your product is and just letting the customer know what that product is. And we learn this along the way and meeting with these different buyers and understanding how we can support them is important. Um, Jake, to add to that and to add to what Josh was saying is, is I think a really good way to get your products in front of the right buyers is also um, not going after every single store in the state, right? Because you can't support, a small brand cannot support at the retail level, vendor days, digital marketing, social media, all of those things that, that are difficult just for one store, let alone 50, 100 stores. I think the strategy should be pick five stores and go hard with those five stores first. Develop a strong relationship with the Joshes of those five stores the bud tenders of those stores, and then really, really attack that and then scale out and grow like a bush and not like a tree because you're not going to be able to support that if unless you have um, you know millions of dollars worth of budget. And in a state like California, if you live in Southern California, how do you get to the stores that are six, seven, eight hours away? You just can't do it, right? You know, uh, without a large budget. 
And if you're dealing with minimum case packs, we're talking about a hundred to three hundred dollars per case pack of profit that you're making on a case pack, right? So you know maybe the store can sell three to four case packs a month, but you got to really understand your budgets and really understand what it takes to actually support a retail because it's not just blanket social media. Like you have to do targeted things with that particular store that's going to require a budget. And so, you know, I think understanding that is even important before you even go and knock on Josh's door. And when you say five stores, are you talking about five locations or five? Because like once one, a store could be considered like a retail brand that could have like five locations around Southern California. So that's a great question. It could mean either or. So what I mean is, is just five locations that you would pick that those are, and, and that's an arbitrary number. Obviously, you know what your minimum MOQ batch size is when you manufacture something. So if you're a small brand like 40 tons, we may only be able to, you know, do a 20 pound batch. And let's just say we're using flour as an example, right? That's 2,400 approximate eighths, right? So you pick, you figure out, okay, how many, how many, um, how many eighths can I get in a case pack? And what's the sell through rate for each store, and then what is a typical re-up look like in three to four weeks? So then you can also make sure your supply chain is right. Because one thing I know Josh probably super dislikes is when he puts a new brand on his shelf and then the brand can't resupply when the re-up comes because they haven't got their supply chain in order. So really understanding that I think is so important to a buyer, more so than just, hey, I'm going to advertise that I'm in your store but really understanding the operations, the supply chain mechanics so that you can really handle the business because doing in-store demos and all that stuff to me is secondary to making sure that the primary thing is making sure your supply chain is right, making sure you can support Josh the way that he needs to and making sure that when Josh says, hey, I need another reorder in two and a half weeks, you can supply him without any kinks in the chain. Yeah, how I often... Think Okay. <laughs> I'm just guessing, Josh. No, I was going to say, uh, it, it seems counterintuitive when you're really trying to blow your brand up, but under promise and over deliver. Like you, people in this industry, it's a really small pool of, of uh, people working in this. And, and, you know, someone working at one company today could be at an even bigger company tomorrow. And if you've proven to them that you, you deliver what you say you're going to deliver, they'll take your phone call. They'll, you know, it, it's a long term play that, can be really tough when you're facing bills at the end of every month and, and payroll every two weeks. But if you can figure out a way to, uh, like, like Anthony said, you got to start with a quality product and really just stick with what you do well, build it out organically and, and take the necessary steps so you don't get too far ahead of yourself, then it'll all pay off in the end because there's so many other brands that are skipping steps, are trying to, to cut the line and get ahead who think that um, certain things don't matter when everybody else is telling them it does. Uh, and like Anthony said, I, I only have so much patience for a brand trying to place reorders because when my marketing team is reaching out about setting up more vendor days and my uh, store teams are reaching out about, they have customers continuously asking for this product. And the same thing I have to tell them is, well, it's ordered. I just don't know where it is. I don't like having those conversations because it doesn't make me look like I'm on top of my job. Um, we're in a state in Michigan where there aren't any license limits. And unfortunately that gives a lot of power to the retailers in terms of if you drop the ball, there's probably 10 more people who've been calling me today yeah. to try and fill that space. So um, it's definitely something that you gotta be on your P's and Q's, but under, yeah. under promise over deliver relationships and what are some of the things like the number the you know, top five things that that brands that you're working with do or or don't do that ends up getting them kicked off the shelf first and foremost uh, i'd go with compliance i just say i want to grab my that's all right all right i can i can you, uh, well, oh, oh, yeah see now we got another, yeah, i got them in my lap now we're good um uh, Compliance is a really big one. It's one where, uh, you know, we're coming from 
the industry not have basically working around the rules to now trying to build up the rules and and some of those rules almost seem counter to what we're trying to do to put out the best product possible so by no means am i trying to advocate that the rules are correct but we all have to work within the rules uh and and whenever this even goes back to that first stopping in at my ann arbor store to drop off samples if you just walk in with a duffel bag full of of sacks and you don't have any metric tags on them you don't have a manifest put together not only is my team not going to be able to accept it but they'll then say hey josh this person doesn't know compliance they were trying to break rules uh, even if your intentions were the best possible uh, if two hours later someone from the uh, the cra shows up and does a quick inspection and we have non-compliant products in our store we're the ones that have to deal with the consequences, not the vendor. So th there are some missteps right, right off the bat. Compliance would be one. And then second, uh, again, what Anthony had touched on, understanding your place in the market. Uh, if you're a brand that thinks you can command $2,000 a pound and you have outdoor product and outdoor is selling at 600 a pound. Be nice to outdoor product. Uh, nothing wrong with outdoor product. I, I'm teasing. I, if anything, My boy Greg like, would, would, wouldn't like that. I'm just teasing. I'm just teasing. <laughs> it's it's one of those like it's just different conversations, right? Yeah. It's it's there's certainly better outdoor versus worse outdoor. I mean, everything has a best and a worst, and then what's in between. Uh, but everybody has a dollar to be spent on whatever shelf it is that they're looking for right so some people walk in with five dollars in their pocket some people roll up in a rolls royce and and can unload and drop five stacks in your in your store so uh we need products that can fill any of those needs so if you can understand where you fall in the market and i don't have to explain to you where your product belongs in the market because um, sometimes that can be a difficult conversation with someone's baby um I'm here to just tell you how to sell your products uh, through our stores. So, you know, to add to that, you know, if you guys are out there listening to what Josh is saying, he's and when Jake picked five things that people do to get off the shelf, to me, the first one that he said that's compliance, which was his number one thing, that should be a given. Like there should be no reason why the retail has to take your stuff off of the off of the shelf because you didn't do your due diligence. That is something that you, if you just do that, you, you heard what he said, you've eliminated probably 25% of your competition just off of that, which to me, like it's a given that I would make sure that that's hap happening. You do it at the package level when you're designing, you do it at the testing level, you do it at the manufacturing level. There should be no reason why your stuff isn't compliance checked multiple steps of the, of the manufacturing process. So to me, I look at that like I love hearing things like that because that's just a quick victory for me that I've just eliminated 25 percent of those people, you know, um, and, I, you know, I find also, too, uh, a lot of times buyers will give you that first shot. Um, but if you don't support them, that's it. And I, you know, I've learned that the hard way. And I've learned that because I tried to grow too fast, too short of a time and I couldn't support those retailers. So now I've dialed back my strategy and selecting those five stores, that's arbitrary, that could be 10, 15, seven, whatever, but you know, a small handful and really focusing on those particular retails so that I can develop a strong relationship. In fact, in doing that too, you make your stuff exclusive just to those locations. So now if you build up enough you know, demand, you're gonna help the store as well because you're bringing in new customers for your products. That's the end goal, right? Is to bring in a new customer to that store. Unfortunately, cannabis is not like 7-Eleven where when you walk into 7-Eleven, you know exactly you wanna go buy this cool ranch Dorito. And you don't worry about the salesperson selling you that Dorito. They're not saying, hey, we got these seven different bags of chips, which one do you want? Cannabis isn't at that level yet. So we rely on the bud tender. But if we can figure out ways to not do that and bring customers to them, kind of like what Media Gel does. Shameless plug, but not shameless, because that's what you guys yeah. do. Um, that's where I think we can provide extra value to buyers is like, hey, we can actually help drive traffic. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, no, going off of that point, um, 
particularly this time of year, the uh, right after the holidays in January, February, where customers are a bit tighter with their wallets and, and, you know, they're waiting on the tax returns to come through. I'm looking for brands that have followings that, that have customers who, if we said, Hey, we are dropping this product in our store in, in Grand Rapids, we have people hitting us up saying, what day is that coming? You know, they show up that day. It's not out there yet. Why isn't it there? Like that level of, of, uh, uh, interest in the product and, and um, driving customers to our stores. We're competing with other retailers, just like you all are competing for shelf space on ours. So uh, we want to be able to say, hey, this product that you all in the market want, all you customers, we have it at our store. So come come through our doors. Um, you know, th- there's one way of uh, market saturation. Make sure you're aware of how many stores in one market you're in. Uh, because certain products, you you have a cap on how much can be sold. And, and if you start having retailers uh, looking at their neighbors and seeing your products on their shelves, they're not going to complain to the neighbors. They're going to complain to you about it. Um, uh, and then w- one last thing um, about like following before you even get started, uh, the samples that you do get to the buyer. I'm not saying inflate it so the buyer has a false sense of what products will be landing in their stores. I know that any any batch is different than the next batch or the one before it, but you really th- there's a lack of due diligence and a lot of brands that just allows me to really quickly vet uh, getting samples that are almost a year old of flour, um, getting uh, oh, wow people do edit- that now. They do. They do. Uh, sending me flour that's been remediated. Like we can have a conversation about remediation. I'm not doing any blanket statements, but if you don't own up to whatever it might be, it feels like you're trying to pull a veil over the purchaser's eyes and uh, the bud tenders and the inventory staff are even more on the lookout for those things. And, and uh, it's a whole lot worse when they find it than when I find it, because then there's the egg on my face and uh, it becomes an even bigger, uh, uh, bigger thing. But uh, for me, I also feel like it doesn't give me a true sense of, of your products. If you're giving me something that's a year, year old, yeah, even if it's um, like you're new to the game and it's your first run, tell the buyers that. Make it very clear that this was your first run, that this was you haven't gotten your rooms fully dialed in yet, because there's been more than once where I've been ready to say no. And I asked the vendor if it was their first run and they said yes. And so I say, well, then let me see your second because um, not all buyers are willing to take that much time. Not all, uh, not all understand most that buyers, the plant is, most buyers. I was going to say, the, the plan is fickle and it's something where a lot of buyers, most buyers, as, as Anthony was saying, they don't have the patience for it. Uh, for me, like we want to have the best products on our shelves. Having that vertical side, we understand that. Um, as much as we want to make this an exact science, growing cannabis is still uh, every day you're going to see something new or something unexpected. Um, so I want some transparency with with the people that I'm working with. Like if you had a run that got seeded out, I need to know. We'll figure out something to work with it. So the, this the first fact, impression, go ahead, go ahead. No, the first impression is important. And not to interrupt you, I'm saying the fact that you're even talking about remediation and selling, giving an old sample. Like to me, that's just mind boggling because as a brand, I wouldn't like you're eliminating yourself before you even walk in the door. So if I'm a viewer watching this and wanting to get knowledge and gain from it, what I'm hearing is like, just do good business. <laughs> like get a good, not, yeah. it's not even that difficult, right? Like you, this, you can't do things like that. You, like that, those are, those are automatic eliminators. So if we're, if we're, if I use the analogy that we're running up a hill, why would I want to put extra weight on my back? Right? Like it makes no sense. And the things that you're talking about are the extra weights that I'm running up a hill carrying. So like the proof is in the pudding on what Josh is saying that like, just have all of your stuff together when it comes to samples. It's difficult, right? Because if you're a big brand, you know, you can afford to give out tons of samples. Giving one sample to Josh is nothing, but aggregating that over the course of 100 stores, 50 stores with 10 bud tenders, managers each, it becomes really pricey. And so it's difficult for brands like ours. So Jake, I have a question for Josh. What do you recommend, Josh, when brands like ours 
who are small, who may not be able to afford these large budget samples, but can, you know, at least afford one sample per buyer per store. Mm -hmm. How do we, how do we get our products to you guys with knowing that we can't really support you at the monetary level because we can't afford to send 20 samples for 20 bud tenders in one location? For sure. For sure. I think if it's if it's an initial um, like you're trying to just get me the product, you're trying to get my feedback on it. I, I hate to say go right past my bud tenders, but they don't need to see samples until I've given them the thumbs up. Uh, I, I think a lot of people believe that if you win over the bud tenders, you're going to win over the buyer. And quite honestly, that's not the case. Uh, bud tenders get really locked into their specific markets, their specific stores even they might have heard something that day of, oh, we're sitting low on on infused pre-rolls. And then someone walks through the door with an infused pre-roll. And suddenly this is the answer to all their prayers. And it's like, no, we actually have orders delivering to you tomorrow. So I think if you, uh, you know, get strategic about the retailers that you want, you know, these are the ones that we will forsake all other retailers if we can get on their shelves and build a business and really target those. Uh, cause if, if you're giving them the best product possible, um, good buyers who are connected within the market are talking to other buyers and they're talking to other, uh, retailers and other consumers. And at the very least, like we're just like wholesale in that we want to make connections and, and make, uh, meaningful relationships in this market on either side of it. And so I'll tell my other buyer friends, Hey, this product, which doesn't fit what we're trying to do, or it's, it's priced in a range where we've already got representation in that range, but this is a product that you need to check out. Like, this is something that, uh, like win over the buyer as a consumer, uh, the good buyers are consumers. Uh, and then from so. there, uh, you, you know, it's, it, it's done me well. Uh, it see, it seems to do pretty well. You smoke um, a lot of free only, weed, huh? And consume a lot of free stuff, I'm sure. Uh, if we want to go back to the remediated outdoor yeah. conversation. Uh, <laughs> yeah, actually, real uh, quick, guys, because maybe not awesome. everyone knows what we're talking about with remediation. So what is that and why? Yeah, just kind of explain what that is. For sure. I mean, Anthony, do you want to take that one? Do you want me to? No, no, go ahead. Go ahead. I want to hear how so, you explain it. For sure. So from my perspective, um, remediation will oftentimes involve, I mean, it typically starts with a failed um, testing, uh, state level testing. Oftentimes it's for total yeast and mold uh, or aspergillus, like something that you definitely don't want in your smoke. And uh, what um, there's a process that can be performed after it's failed testing to for lack of a better term, microwave the, the weed and kill the, the mold spores that are forming in the plant uh, and render it consumable uh, for, for customers. Um, that's kind of a very spark notes version of it. And quite honestly, it's, it's something that there's almost a gray area within it in the industry. Cause I think a lot of people, it's kind of that one thing you really don't want to talk about, but um, the, the major player, like the, the really big, huge grow operations oftentimes are ones that, uh, get called out the most for it, but it's something that everybody, everybody has a, a, a room that molds out or has a, has a, a, an issue once in a while. Like it's, it's not a very often thing. A, and the people who oh, go ahead. No, I'm sorry. I'm saying, is there a compliance that if your weed is remediated, that you have to say that it is no. And there's also uh, some of the big players, uh, I'm not going to say any names because I'm not trying to drag anybody, but there are groups who, if they're consistently failing tests, their next step is to just pre-remediate the flower. Uh, so then that way it's not failing any tests. So me as a buyer, like I can do all my due diligence, but there's no recording saying that it's been remediated. Uh, however... Wow. When you see as much product as I have and you see non-remediated flower versus remediated flower and you, you smell it and you like you, you can start to tell the difference. You can start to look for different indicators here and there. Um, and it, it, it's something that it's kind of a, no one really wants to talk about it to the public because they don't want consumers to be aware of it. But it is something in our industry that I don't know, I, I feel like we need to at least come to terms with and, and figure out how we can coexist with it. Cause the, the testing side is the frustrating, frustrating aspect of it. I, not against the vendors or anything. It's, it's a, a necessary evil that we have to work within, but 
it is something that, um, you know, if a customer finds out that a product is remediated, they're going to, they're going to hang out to dry both the, the person who produced the product and the retailer that sold it to them. And the brand that it's behind. Yeah. yeah. So I say all that, that he says all that to say everybody, like, just don't just buy good quality product. And if you're in our situation where you're, a, you know, a licensing agreement or you're a white labeler, you just don't buy that. You know what I yeah. mean? Like, these are all things that he's giving you to kind of get to the front of the line before you even walk in the store, right? Because there's a long line outside waiting to get in. And if you just do these basic steps that are things that you would want done to you, if you were on the other side of the foot or the coin, that's going to get you to the front of the door. Obviously, when you get inside, it's up to you to keep that position with support, with supply chain consistency and with, you know, marketing and promotion. But a lot of the times people don't even get inside because of these types of situations. Yeah. In particular, if you're a processor um, looking to do purchasing, you got to be aware of anybody and anybody, everybody could have a, a batch of moldy product that they're looking to send to processing. And that doesn't necessarily mean that it's wrong. It's just, uh, you know, communication, everything moves so quickly in this industry that sometimes communication is, is the last thing to get to where it needs to get to. So if modest. you're, yeah, yeah. You don't want remediated weed. No. <laughs> but but no. I get, I get where you're saying and you're being modest about it. You know, I appreciate <laughs> your tone. I'd be politically correct there, right? Yeah. 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 You don't want that crap. <laughs> So no, it, it, it's an easy way to separate yourself from others. If all you give are, is quality, smokable product that consumers can set their watch to, like, yeah, one testing batch might come out 2% THC lower than the last one, but no one's going to, you know, if someone gets that bent out of, out of shape over that, we can handle that as, as a retailer. Upset about health, potential health issues, potential um long-term effects that we aren't fully aware of the, the there hasn't this hasn't been in existence long enough for the government to say this is healthier than the alternative uh we, we got to be those vetting uh vetting groups and we we have to be better so that the customers get a better experience great i want to um do a couple things here i want to circle back on something you said anthony and then I want to go through a, a live on-air pitch. We'll have 40 tons pitch to Josh, and we'll see how that goes. Um, but, you know, you were, you were mentioning some things, Anthony, about, you know, why would someone do these things? Why would they forget what seems like table stakes to you? You know, you're someone who's been through a bunch of these mistakes, right? You said you've learned from some of the mistakes that you made. And, you know, starting, a, these are startups, right? These are businesses. Um, there's a lot of things to do. You are never done with all the things that you need to do. And you need to prioritize and figure out in which order to do things, which is which is why we're having this conversation, right? To help share some of the lessons um, to people that might be interested in figuring that this out. And maybe they don't have to learn some of the lessons the hard way like you did. Um, so I wanted to circle back and, and maybe give me a couple anecdotes of some, you don't have to tell me your worst mistakes, but maybe pick a couple that, that helped you learn some lessons as you went through your journey to going from a, a brand with no product to a brand with products on the shelves today in multiple states. Um, and then we'll, we'll get into a little pitch and then we'll open up uh, questions to the audience. Sure. So I'll say, well, you know, we've been blessed with having a really good, strong foundational brand that we set. So on the brand side, we we've, we've been we've been we've been pretty good. The CPG side is where we've learned all the mistakes where you know we can you know improve on. What I will tell you is this is that if you're in a white label situation like we are, um, you know, four years ago, being the white labeler was terrible, right? You have no access to your license, you have no control over your supply chain, really. You're 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 you know, you're 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 kind of at the lowest part of the totem pole. But as we've seen that the market has shifted completely, being a white label actually allows us to be ultra nimble. And so if we try something and it doesn't work, we're not stuck with owning this real estate or having thousands of pounds of product or whatever it may be. So it actually works in our favor now being that. Where I would say that the biggest mistake we made, and, I, and this is just from trial and error, it's not due to anyone, is when you're looking for a when you're looking for a white label situation, you can't a la carte your 
you're stuck. I mean, you can't, it's very difficult to have an independent cultivator, an independent manufacturer, an independent processor, an independent um, distributor, an independent, you know, transportation, all of that. Finding a vertical is going to be really, really important because of manufacturing quantity minimums. So for example, if you have a distribution that requires, um, or if you have a distribution that sells your product at a specific sell-through rate, how do you guess what your batch size should be for your next batch? Well, the way that you would do it is you would you would do it based on the batch before how fast it sells through. Well, what if it doesn't sell through fast for a variable amount of factors, right? So then now when you go to re-up your manufacturing quantity, your manufacturing quantity quantity may not be enough to meet the manufacturing minimums of an independent manufacturer. So you, you're stuck in this, this purgatory situation where the distributor wants to order, let's say 752 uh, units, but your manufacturing minimums are 4,000 units. And if you buy the 4,000 units, that means you're sitting on this inventory for a long period of time because your sell-through rate wasn't what you thought it was going to be. That was a very, very, very big thing that we learned that we would never have learned without going through that. So having a vertical will allow you to be able to go to the cultivator and the manufacturer within that vertical and say, I need 742 units for next month and not this three, 4,000 batch MOQ. To add insult to injury along with that is, is that when you do it that way, your cost of goods significantly rise. So now when you go to sell your wholesale unit to the retail, to Josh, you're forced to have to come sell him a product at the level in which major competitors are at. So you have no sales velocity to your item. So really learning that is where now the next iteration of 40 tons is going to kill it because I'm going to come in with a product that has high sales velocity because I'm beating everybody in my category just on price. Then you add the branding and add everything and the support and all that. It's just a win-win for someone like Josh. So that's where we failed was all la carte and everything, which means higher cost of goods, which means I can't meet manufacturing minimums, which means when I... Uh, I have too much inventory if I do meet those. So my, my cash flow is now eaten up. And so really figuring out that balance. That is key. Everything else is secondary. Everything else is just waving the flag of my brand and saying, hey, come buy me. Right. And figuring out how to do that. The hard part is in that supply chain. And that's where I've made major mistakes, not because we were dumb, but because we didn't know and had to learn. Yep. That's great. I feel like you already started to get into the pitch with your answering the question, but let's, let's ring a bell here and say that, um, you, you know, you're have, you've gotten past the bud tender and you get okay. to sit down at Josh's desk with his, his cute little dog, um, and tell him about how great your product is and why people are going to buy it. Well, Hey, Hey, uh, Josh. So, you know, my name's yeah, Anthony. Name. I'm, I'm one of the representatives of 40 tons brand. I've given you, you know, I've sent you stuff uh, in the past. I wanted to actually ask you, uh, you know, uh, before I even try to sell you one of my products, like what types of products in your stores are you seeing a, a high amount of velocity on? And where are you, where are you lacking product? Like, is there a specific category that you have that we could potentially support? For sure. No, uh, the biggest movers for us uh, are often the flower categories, bulk flower, prepack flower. Uh, but one opportunity that I'm seeing in the market right now, especially because a lot of different brands we've tested out and just haven't seen what we want to see. But infused pre-rolls is something that uh, I'm looking for right now. Do you have inf infused pre-rolls or even like, uh, is that coming down the pipe for you all? What do you think? Well, you know, ironically, uh, I actually do have an infused pre-roll. Um, awesome. It's a two gram uh, hash infused, diamond infused blunt. Um, here it is. Um, if awesome. you'd like, I can, I can either uh, give you a sample now and or I can have uh, my distribution send you one through metric. Sure. Um, 
what do you, so, do, what do you ha- think in those, like what's the cost on those and, and where do you see them sitting on the shelf, like price wise? Sure. So this particular product is a premium product. So you might not see a, a high amount of velocity, but um, what I will tell you is this, is that we're working on actually a very inexpensive, a um, what's it called? A, a value product that's coming down the pipeline that will have a three pack um pre-roll three pack three pack of one gram pre-rolls infused um that's going to be a very good value pack that you can out the door uh get to your customer for around 20 to 25 bucks um this this particular hash infused this is like the cream of the crop this is like a high-end product like a cigar um and it's coming in right around 14 dollars uh wholesale so you'd sell this for like around 30 bucks Awesome. Awesome. And then I, I, I heard that you uh, white label the product. Are you rolling the donuts in house? So those get rolled um, uh, third party as well. So that's a great question, Josh. One of the great things about us as a white labeler is we're not just a white label or buying somebody else's product, putting it in our packaging and then calling it a day. If we did that, why would the bud tender sell our product for $2 more when they could go to XYZ brand and it's the same stuff and it's $2 cheaper? So we knew that going into our our, uh, our uh, manufacturing process. And so what we've done, we've actually kind of partnered with a creative manufacturer. So even though we're not holding the license in manufacturing, we have a manufacturing partner that has allowed us to make custom products. Number one, we don't cannibalize their products, right? If they're putting out a one gram sativa xyz we're not going to make that same product so that's first and foremost secondly um here's some information about this manufacturer blah 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 best hash maker blah 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 all that you know boom you got the manufacturer like i'm pitching that and so we can actually make custom products um now as you know you know making a product is not just simple however i because we're so nimble if i see that there's a demand for what it is that you're wanting um, and we could come to an agreement where we have some manufacturer uh, or some minimum purchasing from you. I'm willing to pivot and actually make those uh, those uh, items, those SKUs that you're that you're looking for. But for this particular SKU, it's hand rolled um, and it's it's manufactured. And this particular product is only a 40 tons product. Love it, love it. And then uh, you were talking, you mentioned that there are a possibility for bulk deals. Is there? So I've got 12 locations. Is there possibilities of if uh, I ordered for all 12, let's say, combining together what the total quantity is and and maybe talking deals or discounts or some type of uh, promo that way? So everything is negotiable, right? Obviously, I want to get my stuff put into all of your stores. That would be the great thing, right? When you get your shoe put in Foot Locker, it's not just one, it's 100, right? So I know that I'm going to have to give you price points and price breaks. Number one, before we even get into that, though, Josh, is I want you to know that I'm a small brand, okay? And where these big brands can make more things happen for you, we can't yet without the help of you. So if you bleed me, I can't support you the way that you want to be supported. Here are all the things about the brand that we are. Black female owned, social equity, social impact. I've already pitched you on everything that we're doing. We are doing what you and all of your bud tenders and a majority of this industry want, which is to free the cannabis prisoners and to do all the different things that we're doing in this industry. I can't do that if you squeeze me on a dollar because a dollar less on my unit price really has more of like a dollar fifty implication to my bottom line. Now, I know that that doesn't mean anything to you in terms of bottom line, but I want to preface this with this conversation so that you know where we're at, because I have to build um, with you in order to get to the place where you want to be. So I do have a range of, 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 of a buying. I'm offering these at $14 if you just buy a single case pack, but we, let's work a deal out. Let's chop, let's chop up the numbers. Because I don't want to give you a number where I lose. And I definitely don't want you to give me a number where you don't win either. And let's figure that out. For sure. Well, let's let's take a look at what markets you're in, which one of the markets we have stores in. Also, which markets you're not in that we have stores in. Because that could be this first opportunity of, uh, you know, I don't got to order it for all my stores. But if we can be smart and strategic about where we put it in uh, and make sure that we get a success there. There's nothing wrong with uh, people wanting more and we just got to tell them to wait until it gets here. Uh, Great point. Nothing like building up that. 
Great yeah. point. In fact, I, I was going to suggest something like that. Um, believe me, I would love to get all my products put into every one of your stores. But realistically, like, is that is that a smart thing for us to do to grow properly? Like maybe we can pick, you know, geographically, let's take a map and look at all your stores. I would already have known that coming into this meeting, like where you guys are all at. So for Michigan, I would say, you know, like, let's definitely get you up in, you know, your Farmington Hills location, down to your Hamtramck location, over to your, you know, your, uh, your uh, Southfield location, right? And maybe we pick those three locations that kind of circle the whole area of Detroit, um, and then let's really go hard on that. If we see success in those three, then let's figure out a way for us to get into the rest of your stores so that we can actually support you. The good thing is, is that everything is under your one banner. So, you know, it's the, it's C3 stores, right? Mm -hmm. I yeah. don't re recall what the name is, but for this example. That's good. Oh, good. So, High profile. Yeah. So I would, I would, I would, I, I can advertise C3 w versus where I would have you know, three or 12 individual stores that are completely all independent. So like we could do a campaign here, some really cool stuff that we're doing. We got some motion logos. This is what I can support you with. And I'm going to work my way up. Um, I have a deal with Hemper where we have these products um, that we could do BOGOs with. Um, so there's opportunities for us to do things that we could run uh, specials with and do it. The bottom line is, is, you know, I know that I'm being long winded on this first conversation with you, but I really want to get everything out so that we have a baseline of understanding of where you're at and where I'm at. So then that way I can you can you can help me grow and I can help you help us. And so being that we're a small brand, we're not in the position to do a lot of the things that you're used to, but we are willing to try. And if you believe in us, let's go. Love it. Love it. No, that, that was great. Uh, one thing I wanted to call out that Anthony mentioned, like you could tell that he understood what his brand was and taking ownership of the, the white label side. Like he, he called it out as a purchaser. If, if I'm talking to a broker and they're talking about brands, I know I immediately call up the, the sales reps or the owners of those brands to try and find out, are they upcharging me as a broker or not? So that being said, white label brands, like you're building something beyond who the, the uh, cultivator or the processors are that you might be working with. And that's what we're looking for uh, on the retail side. There's a lot of people out there growing who just don't know how to sell weed. Uh, it might sound crazy, but they're just there, there to grow it. They're not there to sell it. So white labeling isn't a, a, a you know, taboo word or anything like that, but it just all feeds itself back to understand who you are and who you are in the market and be confident in that. If you try and convince me of something that's not true, it's going to, the truth is going to come out one way or the other. So uh, it saves us all a lot of time. And, and again, I'm going to talk to other uh, buyers and other people in the market and anybody I have a good interaction with, I'm going to be talking up and, and saying, Hey, let, let's, you need to get in touch with this person. If I couldn't make the purchase, because I want them to still be around when I can make the purchase. Um, Mr. Josh, um, you know, thank you for letting me come into, you know, your store today. Um, how realistic is it, is, is it for us to place an order today? Today is going to be tough. Uh, we, we base all of our decisions based off of sales numbers. I get sales reports once uh, every, twice a week, once every Monday and every Friday. Uh, but that being said, I get a sales report tomorrow. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a look at my store's numbers. You were saying the infused pre-rolls is that, you know, that boot or that high end infused pre-roll is a category that we could uh, target. And you also help me out knowing that I don't have to look at all of my stores. So I've got about three or four stores that I usually test products out in first. And I think what I'm going to do is just check my sales numbers. If we can make an order right away, I'm going to shoot you a message first thing, much as I know. Uh, and if we can't get an order going, um, I'm going to reach out to you sometime next week. And then at the very least, we can start getting some allocations together, start building what that first order will look like. Uh, sure. And then I can give you the thumbs up when uh, when the green light's there. Well, I will tell you this. If you actually place an order today, it's a one time offer. And I can really, really give you that price that you're looking for. Like these are tactics, the obviously. I before, so. <laughs> <laughs> These are obviously tactics, you know, sales tactics that you would use, like based on like how you feel the situation is going. But what I will tell you, um, one of the number one things, and this is for all brands to take note is when I'm talking to you is, is what I want to do before we even do any marketing or anything with this product is I want to do some bud tender training. 
I want to come in and I want to actually, you know, schedule, let's say maybe three sessions in a day because you have different people on the floor at different times and actually give you um, the pitch on what 40 tons is and why. Um, and I think that if we can win over the win over the people uh, that are selling this product, that's first and foremost. I'm going to guarantee you, Josh, that I'm going to get you a product that is fair at the price in which you're paying for it. If you're buying Budweiser from me, you're going to buy it for Budweiser prices. I'm not going to sell you Budweiser at an IPA cost, right? And and sometimes I may even give you an IPA at you know a Modelo price because I want to take care of you, right? But you'll never I'll never sell you a a Honda Accord at the price of a Mercedes. Um, and so uh, you have that commitment from me. Um, and if there's ever you know something that you don't like of of mine, I'm open to that feedback so that we can always increase our manufacturing. Uh, prowess to be better you know that the, the whole thing here is to get better for sure no we're, we're looking for partnerships we're looking for long term which uh, seems counterintuitive in an industry that moves as quickly as we do and changes every week but you know i i want uh, to be working with people that i enjoy working with i, I want to be able to if something goes wrong pick up the phone give you a call and uh by the end of that phone call we're both understanding that it's going to be taken care of and we're going to move on so um, I, I appreciate everything that you're offering today. And, and I can already tell that we'd be uh, a good working relationship uh, going from here. So more than looking forward to the next conversation we have and uh, be sure to add me to your menu list as well. Cause uh, I'm always checking the menus, even if I may not respond, I'm looking at them. I'm keeping my eye out for opportunities. And um, since we've met and since we've chatted, even if it's not immediate, I, I know what I'm looking for and how I can get your products on my shelves. And when I see those opportunities, I'm going to let you know, uh, and even in the meantime, if you reach out, I'm going to let you know where we're at and, and um, what it would take to get to that point. So sure. Are you on Instagram and LinkedIn by any chance? I am uh, on LinkedIn. You can just find me, Joshua Smith, um, on my Instagram page. It is that is, you? Yeah, that's me. There you okay, go. Okay, cool. Yeah, hey, I'll follow you right now. Perfect. Perfect. And then you got my uh, contact info, cell phone info, everything like that. Yes, I'm putting awesome. it in my phone right now. Boom. Great. Um, cool. Before we get out of here, um, I see that you're wearing a lanyard. Um, we actually have pins. Would you would you wear a pin of, of, of ours? I'll definitely take it. I got a nice uh, a nice little collection, but definitely the brands that we put on our shelves and, and we rock with. I'm probably going to be asking you for more than a pin to come up. So. Sure, sure. Well, actually, before I give you this pin, I need to qualify you before you can wear it. Um, okay. I do it with everybody. I apologize. But do you believe that nobody should be locked up over a nonviolent cannabis offense? Absolutely. Okay, well, then here's this pin. I would, I'd be honored for you to wear it. And when you wear it, that's what it represents. And if someone asks you, what does that pin mean? All you have to say is 40 Tons is a brand that believes no one should be in prison for the plant. Everything else they could go to Google and figure out. But that's Love what it. that means. Love Thank it. You. Thank you. Thank you. And I, I, I wish. I, I'm with. I'm giving that point to the viewers. This is my hook. But you figure out that hook to the buyer to be able to give them something that is impactful, that's going to make them want to remember your brand moving forward. And so that's what the demonstration of that was. If it's a pin, it's a pin, whatever. That's what it is for us. I mean, that's that's living your brand's message, too. If, if you say you're something and then it, it falls flat on its face and turns out superficial, then that's one thing. But when you, you say your brand is something and then you live it uh, in person that gives us that much more confidence to stand behind it as retailers and say, Hey, this is, um, this is this brand that we believe in and here is their message. We want our customers to believe in it as well. Man, I really appreciate that. Um, hopefully Jake, you know, that worked for the, for people and we got a great understanding of, of it, but like, this is how you sell. Right. Yeah, I mean, what Josh is looking for. It's great for me. I've never been part of this process, right? You know, I'm over on the marketing side, helping get, you know, brand in front of, and that's actually the only, you know, thing that I would, I would say that you forgot to mention, which is the, you know, digital co-marketing campaigns that you can run along with your brand or the retailer to drive. I was going to say that actually, no, you're yeah. right. So one, one of the things that I would be like physically could say to you, Josh, is, is like in addition to all of these things, I have a partnership with Media Gel that they gave us $40,000 to run programmatic ads to drive direct traffic to you. Now, keep Love in it. mind, you know, it costs about and as you know, it costs about $1,000 just to get a campaign going. I'm willing to spend that. But like 
you have to purchase from me enough. And like, as you can see, a single case pack is going to yield me $180. So we need to just make that work. But I'm willing to spend that budget on you where you have a $0 customer acquisition to send my customer into your store that you now have their name, email, phone number, and more than likely they're going to buy more than just my product. And I'm willing to spend that with you because I believe in not only my brand, but I believe in your retail. For sure. For sure. And uh, anybody who's watching who thinks uh, Anthony might be giving up too much, what I can say on our end is uh, once we have people on our shelves, we open up our uh, reporting power and our network of stores. And, I, you know, we get very transparent with our partners because, again, we want them to succeed just like us. So if you want to know how your product is selling in our Flint store, I can let you know. I can tell you which SKUs are selling better than others. I can tell you uh, you know, we can run a text message campaign and we could tell you how many customers opened up the text message from uh, priceless information. You, yeah. There's different things where there is benefits to, to partnering with certain groups that will be partners for you. So, um, great. Yeah. We, we've got a question. You want to answer that one? Anthony? Yeah. The one we're talking about brand reordering. Uh, there's one here about recommending appointment setting. Oh, here you go. Would you recommend setting appointments ahead of time doing walk-ins? This way? So that's a great question. Um, if you can, yeah, a great way to get to get to get up to get an appointment is by doing this. Ding, ding, ding. Hey, how you doing? Someone answers the phone. Hey, I was wondering um, uh, if you could connect me with the person who I can bring a sample to. Um, we have a brand, and we would like to drop off some samples soon. When you do it that way, they're going to automatically think like, okay, let me get you to the GM or the buyer. If they get me straight to the buyer, I'll go into my little elevator pitch real quick. Hey, how are you? I know you're busy. I just wanted to let you know my name's Anthony. I have a really good brand. I have XYZ product. What's the best way for me to get you a sample? That's it. Nothing else. Then he's, he or she's going to tell me, boom, great. Once you receive that sample, are you okay with me contacting you in about a week to see how it goes? He or she may say yes. Great. Well, I'm going to be calling you. And then we could set an appointment once you get there or that's one way or um, um, walking into the store and speaking to somebody. Right. So that's the way that I do it. I don't really go for the jugular at first. I try to build a rapport first because everyone's asking he or she for an appointment. So I got to kind of qualify the person and make sure that they want to even hear from me. So like, it's a multi-layered question. It's not just a one specific answer, but I would just get your sample to them. That's the most important thing. If you can get the sample to them, they're going to call you for an appointment if they like your stuff. As long as it's not remediated. <laughs> I was going to go off of that as a quick anecdote, but I had a, uh, a rep one time who we had set up a meeting and they didn't want to send me samples beforehand because they wanted to, talk about the product with me, which already made me a little nervous. And then they canceled that meeting. And then they canceled the meeting we had rescheduled following that. So after that point in time, twice I'd, I'd set up aside time to see the product and hear about the brand. I wasn't interested in setting a third or even interested in going out of my way to see the samples by that point in time, uh, because it just so much had happened and so much had transpired in the four weeks it had taken to try and set it up that the conversation had already changed anyway. So like Anthony said, if, if you can get your uh, samples to the buyer, uh, if you can loop in a meeting with that, great, but get the samples there first because the buyer will be hunting you down uh, if they want your products. And then that makes your lives a whole lot easier. That actually reminds me of something that we were touched on briefly right before we went live. Um, I do believe you hold some sort of record for purchasing a product. Is it the highest price ever or what happened there? I would bet. I mean, Anthony, uh, I'm, I'm curious to hear what his thoughts are on it. But uh, I was living in South Korea for two years uh, teaching English and, and they um, are very dry when it comes to cannabis availability there. And about a year and a half into my stay, one of my fellow teachers said, hey, Josh, I, I've got to connect and we can get some flour, but it's it's not cheap. So we ended up splitting an eighth and the eighth total cost was $450. So I think that comes out to a $27,000 pound, um, something in those ballpark. Uh, yeah, so we split it. So I got uh, half of an eighth for 225 bucks. Wow. Um, How yeah. was it? It was, I mean, it was Cali Sour D. So it, I mean, it was good, right. 
good cow, uh, sour D uh, flour. It's just since it had been a year and a half since I'd smoked the, the, the paranoia that I got from being in a, <laughs> let's just say I had like two puffs and then I gave my buddy the rest and just said, thank you for hooking this up. But uh, I'm, I need to get to California. Basically. That's how yeah. much you, pay, you paid 450 for the eight. Yeah. Yo, That's if you right. can do that, like, dude, all power to you, man. Uh, yeah, I'm just I, I know that there's everybody talks about na- international markets, but if, if you can get into Korea and somehow they legalize it, like, what's up with getting into Korea, bro? Who do we got to talk to, man? <laughs> got to find the K-pop stars. There's the they're the ones that uh, apparently they're picking it up from LA and bringing it over to. Yo, I got the containers in the background, bro. Let's go. <laughs> there you go. There you go. <laughs> I, I, I'll make some calls. Oh, man. great. Josh, we actually do definitely need to do business. We're looking to bring our, our, our stuff to Michigan and mass right now. So okay. we will definitely connect with you when we, when we go, I have a very familiarity with Detroit, as you saw, you know what I mean? So I'm very, very familiar from Hamtramck up to Troy, up to Farmington, Southfield, the whole nine. So I would love to get out there and really do some stuff. And I know Canacon is in Detroit. Uh, and so you know, I'll be coming out there for that soon, but we, uh, we, I had a blast. Yeah, so, no, me too. Anthony, uh, love to connect with you further after this, but, um, uh, and Jake also, thank you. Thank you. Media Joe. Thank, you, thank you everybody for having me. Yeah. Speaking of connections, uh, why don't you guys just real quick say how you can be reached. You kind of already did a little bit, but formally it's a good way to wrap up. Um, if people want to reach out to you, maybe they've got a product they want to pitch you, Josh, or Anthony, maybe someone's, maybe someone listened to your pitch and wants, wants to put you on their shelf. Man, I would love that. Um, so you can find us at 40tons.co. That's co, not dot com. 40tons.co. Every social media handle is 40tons brand, 40tons brand. Um, we have a huge career conference called the Can I Get a Second Chance and Level Up Cannabis Career Conference coming to New York in, um, in the spring. Um, so just look out on our socials for that. Um, and then we also have the 40 Tons Foundation. Um, which you can find um, on our social media and on our regular website, uh, which is our 501c3 charity side. So any of those uh, handles, you can find us. You can email me at info at 40tons.co um, and we'll do our best to kind of respond to you. And we're open to partnerships, collabs, um, and you know, working together with, with good ethical uh, businesses. All right. And then uh, uh, our end, uh, the, in, uh, the company is called C3 Industries, the letter C, number three uh, industries. Uh, we have both high profile retail shops and cloud cover cannabis uh, for cultivation and for processing. Uh, we are in the midst of hiring in uh, multiple states right now, particularly in Missouri. Uh, we are going to be almost doubling the number of stores we have in Missouri once adult use flips on down there. So both cultivation side, processing side, retail side. Uh, if you want to get into the cannabis industry, um, look for, for C3 Industries, look for high profile stores or cloud cover uh, concentrates cannabis. Um, for me personally, you can find me on LinkedIn, uh, Joshua Smith. Um, they think they linked me on, on this uh, event, but feel free to add me, uh, especially if you're working within the industry. I want to know and talk to as many people as I can. Uh, I also have an Instagram page, uh, Shweddy, S-C-H-W-E-D-D-Y, underscore Buds, um, Buds with an S, not a Z. Uh, Can we put mostly... that in the, in the chat? How do we in type the in the chat, uh, yes. Jake? Like the chat that they see. Uh, that's a good question. Oh, there's a chat. Uh, it's down below the questions. You can expand it. it. Uh, that's on our side. But on, how about on your side? Uh, you just changed the bottom. There's a drop down that says panelists. You can s- switch it to everyone. Host oh, nice. panelists, or does it? Oh, switch it to everyone, and then you, whatever you type in will go out. So. No, nah, it doesn't allow it for us. It okay. only allows hosts and uh, panelists, me, you and Josh and me. Well, we can give. We can send out a follow up blast. We can connect with Courtney on the everyone that yeah. attended, and we can send a message cool. out that way um, to get contact info. Um, I'll just wrap it up here. This is uh, Jake Litke, CEO of Media Gel. We help cannabis brands and retailers connect with target audiences by using digital advertising, and we do it through mainstream media. Um, we have uh, explicit approval from our publishers to be running Canvas ads, so we can put you on CNN, Weather Channel, any one of 70,000 publishers now, um, and reach out to me directly if you'd like. It's jake at mediagel.com, and that's mediagel with a J. 
Uh, this has been a very fun episode of Cannabis Marketing Live. Thank you both Josh and Anthony for joining. And uh, we'll chat soon. All right. Talk soon, Thanks, guys. everyone. All right. Have a good one.